I'm Caroline Hyde. This is the best of Bloomberg Technology, where we bring you all our top interviews from this week in tech. Coming up, Netflix's crown jewels. The company out with the huge beat this week as new customers flock to the original content. Plus, the chip maker in the crosshairs will break down the FTC's case against Qualcomm as their fight over licensing heads to court. And why a judge decided not to arrest Samsung's heir apparent. And what's next for South Korea's most valuable company? But first, to our lead. Netflix reports the biggest quarter ever this week, and the stock soared on the news. Netflix added more than 7 million subscribers globally to finish this year with nearly 94 million members. Now, that beat analyst estimates on both the domestic and the international level. The company credits the popularity of new original content, including The Crown and new seasons of Gilmore Girl and Black Mirror. But the cost of all this additional programming is one of investors' chief concerns. Bloomberg editor-at-large Corey Johnson and joined us to break down all the numbers. This wasn't too long ago. This was a company that rented DVDs. Yeah. And then it was companies that would put movies on with a little bit of original content. Most of their spending right now is going towards original content, including shows like Luke Cage, where they've got a master plan, where they're thinking uh, it's not just Luke Cage, but Luke Cage, Daredevil, Jessica Jones. They'll throw in some Iron Fist, and then they'll have their own Avengers, which they're going to call Defenders, part of the Marvel Universe. They're thinking sort of forward how they're going to build a, a, a mountain of, of original content. They've also spent a fortune on marketing. Uh, this is the biggest spend they've ever had in the world of marketing. So that the numbers they put up in terms of uh, marketing spend were uh, not only greater than ever before, it's, it, you can show an increase. It's now 11.5% of revenues when that number seemed to be coming down. Remember that they just raised a bunch of money in the debt markets so they could buy more content. But what they're doing with a lot of that money is plowing it into marketing, and plowing it yeah. into ads. They actually saw, it, I found it really interesting, not only great success in buying subscribers internationally, because that's what marketing dollars are, it's a question of how long you keep those subscribers, also buying subscribers domestically. They actually saw a tick up in the number of domestic subscribers, which looked like that market was completely completely saturated, growing less than a single percentage point in every quarter. This last quarter, they actually grew at 4%, which I found really, uh, really yeah. positive for the company. But again, that's merely a function of how much you spend. What we really want to see is how long those, those subscribers st stick around. I mean, certainly, it's interesting. Sales still up 36%. That was bang in line. You're seeing earnings, though, despite the marketing spend, still beating. It was up 50%. It looks as though the market's liking it from a share reaction point of view. But as we say, the cost of all of this, not only the cost of marketing, but also $6 billion being promised to spend on the original content, well, on content in general next year. Is this going to ring alarm bells in the longer term? So I suggest that people look at gross margins as a way to see where the content cost is happening. Yeah. Ignore what I said. <laughs> Netflix said in the press release, and I think a lot of analysts who look at this Wall Street look at gross margins are foolish to do so, because, same way that I was foolish this morning in saying this, because gross margins doesn't show you what the actual cost of the movies are. This is Hollywood. It shows you whatever cost they want to show. They said in the fine print of the press release that what was going on with this thing was, was uh, uh, the, the recognition of content costs, not the actual content costs. Um, there was one number, there was one number, and you can see the stock trading up a lot after hours, so of course everyone's mm -hmm. ignoring me. They spent, uh, Michael Pactor. <laughs> How dare they? How dare they, right. Michael Pactor, a friend of the show, uh, uh, just tweeted out a minute ago doing some math using some of my numbers and some others. He was looking around, looking at the Netflix numbers, that they spent about $100 for every new subscriber that they got this quarter, which means they'll have to keep those subscribers on a profit basis for like 35 years in order for, to break even on the subscribers. That's not feasible. Yeah. So something's got to give here. Content costs have got to come down. The cost of adding subscribers has got to come down. You don't see it in these numbers. But they can still make inroads into countries they're already pretty big in. So if you look at the US, they're wanting about 50% of, of broadband homes now. That's far less if you're looking at the United Kingdom. There is still room to grow here. In if they can countries. grow that much, yeah. And I think that the, the positive numbers show that 4% increase, while it's tiny, uh, any kind of increase on such a saturated market was interesting to them. But I think that, you know, you can sell a dollar for 50 cents for only so long. So when is the free cash flow going to show up for this company? The free cash flow numbers were stunningly bad. The, the amount of money these guys are blowing through, the subscriber base going up, absolutely. We see those numbers, and it's a very positive number. They've got to have it go up in order to pay for this content. But with that big raise to spend on content, look at this number. Look at this. $618 million in 13 weeks. <laughs> that's $7 million a day. How do you do that? I well, mean, that's, spending on the queen. <laughs> it's, 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 and, and all this other content and all of this marketing, they can't do this forever. This is, you know, forget the profits they show in the income statement. There is cash flowing out the door in incredible size at Netflix. They're hoping they can outlast uh, their competitors, maybe Amazon Prime, HBO, yeah. Showtime. I don't, I don't know, I don't know what, what the plan is there, but as content costs go up, 
and then they're adding marketing costs on top of that, and they're running out of places to grow, yeah. and they're burning through all this free cash flow. It could be a real problem for this business. People can bid the stock up all they want, and it's selling yeah. quite well, but uh, uh, eventually the piper's gonna have to be paid. And we'll see how those shares trade up tomorrow, if indeed they hold on to these gains. Corey Johnson, as ever, great to get your perspective. Editor at large for Bloomberg Television. Staying with Netflix, it's now been 10 years since the company made its most important strategic shift away from DVDs and into streaming. And Bloomberg's Caitlin Meehan looks back at the company's evolution. In January 2007, Netflix announced a bold departure from its core DVD rental business. Watch Instantly allowed Netflix users for the first time to stream a library of about a thousand movies and TV shows over the internet. Back then, CEO Reed Hastings explained the move saying, mainstream consumer adoption of online movie watching will take a number of years. The time is right for Netflix to take the first step. Analysts were skeptical. There were just as many hold as buy ratings on the stock. But consumers saw something different and signed on in droves. By the end of 2010, Netflix subscribers had grown from 6 million to 20 million. At the same time, in-store rental giant Blockbuster filed for bankruptcy. Netflix next set its sights on a new venture in 2013, original content, launching what would become an arms race among its rivals. Netflix spent an estimated $100 million on two seasons of its first original series, House of Cards. Welcome to Washington. But original hits do not come cheap. By 2016, Netflix had produced more than 600 hours of original content at a cost of more than half a billion dollars. And it plans to shell out another $6 billion this year. That's nearly double its programming budget for all of 2014. Netflix has not posted positive free cash flow in two years, and it's on the hook for more than $14 billion in future payments. But. Cash flow concerns aside, it does appear that Reed Hastings' 2007 bet on streaming video is paying off. Netflix now has over 90 million global subscribers and makes more than 94% of its revenue on streaming video. Now another story we're watching, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg took to the stand in a Dallas courtroom Tuesday to defend the company against claims that its virtual reality unit Oculus stole the technology behind the rift. A company called Zenimax Media alleges that Oculus poached one of its star designers along with key intellectual property for its VR headset. It also says Facebook completed its acquisition of Oculus in 2014 with quote, full awareness that its tech was misappropriated. If ZeniMax wins, it could rewrite the story of how Facebook has emerged at the forefront of the virtual reality boom. Now, still to come, we head to this week's gathering of the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Qualcomm chairman Paul Jacobs talks about the Trump administration. This is Bloomberg. Now to a Bloomberg scoop. U.S. regulators have filed a lawsuit against Qualcomm this week for allegedly using unfair practices to license its technology. Digging into the details, the Federal Trade Commission says Qualcomm forced Apple to exclusively use its baseband processors in return for lowering the rate of patent royalties it charged. The world's biggest maker of smartphone semiconductors disclosed back in 2014 that its licensing methods were under investigation by the FTC and a major fine was possible. Qualcomm responded to the allegations saying it has never withheld or threatened to withhold chip supply in order to obtain agreement to unfair or unreasonable licensing terms. Shares tumbled on the news. Now Bloomberg Technologies' Ian King broke the story and joined us along with Bloomberg editor-at-large, Corey Johnson. Well, that's the bombshell for today. I mean, we've had very general accusations against them, you know, obscure kind of legalistic accusations, but this is like specifically saying, no Qualcomm, you used your position to basically force Apple to, to take your chips and that hurt competition. I mean, we are seeing a share market, a, a share price reaction, Corey, but this is a, an ongoing theme, it seems. I mean, South Korea just last month seemed to be 
fining to the tune of less than a billion, but what sort of money do you think is at stake here? Well, it, it's, it gets to the heart of the, the business model for Qualcomm. Fundamentally, the business model for Qualcomm is invent chips that they think are great and then license those chips out for other people to make those chips and install those chips and gain uh, uh, influence by having a standard, often standards written specifically for Qualcomm chips. So uh, this really does get to the heart of their model is, is how, the relationships that they have with the companies that make the phones, and there is no one bigger uh, single phone maker than Apple. In it is a special model that Qualcomm has actually developed here. And right. how much do you think they can fight this in the courts? What's their record like? Um, their record is almost flawless. They never lose, which mm. it, it sounds, I mean, when you look at all of the headlines, you look at all of the trouble they've had over the years, they only ever really lost one case against Broadcom back about five or six years ago. Everything else gets overturned on appeal. After years later, they do a deal. And they're very successful. But just to pick up on what Corey said, though, what they license is actually the fundamentals that go into mobile phone technology. What happens with the chips and the chip designs, that's another business. What today has established or tried to establish for the first time is a link between those two things. And that is the biggest threat to their business so far. So if we're thinking of losers and winners here, the fact that maybe they do end up being thought as guilty, rather it might seem to occur, who does eventually this win out for? Does smartphones get cheaper for you and I? And they would absolutely get cheaper if, if, if vendors, if, if phone makers could shop around for baseband chips. I mean, the baseband chip is one of the most expensive components in a phone. If they could shop around for that, they might end up with lower pricing here. And, and that's what the fundamental of this gets down to: is were those vendors, and were was an Apple, was a Samsung able to go out and find the cheapest chips and the best chips they could get uh, for uh, connecting uh, their phones to the networks, or were they compelled to go to Qualcomm because of other power that Qualcomm has? in the marketplace. I think what's fascinating here is who's doing the talking? Is, is Apple, are executives there are coming to the FTC and saying we feel that we've been hardly done by? Well, for anybody who's interested, if you read around page 25 of the filing, there's a lot of specifics about agreements between the two companies, deals that were signed, renegotiated, resigned. Hard to imagine that that came to the FTC in a dream and that they didn't get that information from somewhere. It wasn't likely that Qualcomm was sending them that information. And, and, and Apple's got everything to gain here. And Apple would certainly like to be able to, to play the, the, the providers against each other. They're, they've been unable to do that according to what was in this complaint. And so the providers that could be winning out of the back of this, do we see any share reaction? Intel, as we actually broke news on last year, has actually managed to get some of the orders take some of those orders away from, from Qualcomm for the first time pretty much in the history in of the Apple phones. In yeah. the Apple phones, right. So a clear beneficiary there, but a lot of other companies have tried to you know, go against Qualcomm over the years and really have just faded away. So, so I mean, brilliant scoop today from your work in, but give us a, a time frame here. Is this something we're going to be talking about over the course of weeks, over months, over years? This is a year's thing. I mean, you have to think, even if, it's because first of all, it's a court case. It's not just going to a judge and saying, give me a judgment. This is actually going to go to court. So you've got all of that, what that entails. And, and Qualcomm cannot afford to let this go. They're going to have to appeal this as far as they possibly can if it goes against them. Now, before the news broke about that US antitrust suit against Qualcomm, Bloomberg's Eric Schatzka caught up with Qualcomm chairman and longtime Democrat Paul Jacobs in the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Eric asked how he's reconciling with the views of the incoming administration. There are Democrats and Republicans, but we're all Americans and we want to see the administration succeed. And in a democracy, you have different points of view. But there's a lot of places where we're very in line. I mean, we want more jobs. We want great trade agreements. Um, we were really happy when the president tweeted about our OneWeb satellite system. So there's a lot of areas where we see alignment. And where there's alignment, we're going to work hard together. And when there's disagreement, we'll also express our, our points of view. Where do you disagree right now? Well, I think immigration is probably one that I, I worry about, at least. I, I wouldn't say we know enough to say that we disagree. But, uh, you know, I think the American dream and the notion of the melting pot has caused the best and brightest to come to the United States and given us a lot of innovation. I think that's a competitive advantage for the country. So that's, that's one that I'd signal out. Anything else that the president-elect has said that concerns you personally or professionally? Oh, I, I mean, you know, it, it, nobody wants a trade war. So we want to make sure that uh, in the cases, for example, in China, where we've sort of gotten through our difficulties there, we're really trying to be a liaison and maybe 
add to helping the situation out, helping promote understanding. So I think that's a, an opportunity for us. To the degree that you can do that, who do you reach out to specifically in the incoming administration to help, to give Qualcomm a voice where you think you can be helpful? Well, I think there's a broad range. I mean, you know, you look at I mean, us it, as Democrats. Is it Wilbur Ross? No, I mean, it's a broad range of, of people within the transition team and in the new administration. But, um, you know, you look at Irwin and I as Democrats, but we have plenty of Republicans in Qualcomm as well. So it's a, it's a big company, and the senior team is pretty well mixed on that. And, and so there are relationships that have been there. We've been working with conservative organizations for a very long time. We're happy to see the focus on innovation and, and the focus on, uh, you know, intellectual property, and these kinds of things are important. Is Silicon Valley well represented? with Peter Thiel as Trump's, call it, tech whisperer? Well, look, we're from San Diego, so we're not necessarily a direct uh, Silicon Valley company. But you know what yeah, I, I think, mean. Yeah, whether tech is represented. I mean, I think that there were certainly concerns in the beginning of many people in the tech community of whether they were represented. And, uh, you know, I don't personally have a relationship with Peter Thiel. I certainly see him at various conferences. But it's good to have somebody on the inside that understands tech. He says that there's no room left for innovation in smartphones. What do you say? I completely disagree with that, and we're going to get all sorts of very cool things coming. Uh, we just showed off some new chipsets that have great processing capabilities in them, gigabit coming down into your pocket, and they do virtual reality, and you don't have to have extra stuff around. It actually uses a camera to figure out what the environment is, and you can walk around and experience virtual reality right away. So what might have motivated him to, to say that if you're so confident that we'll be able to do more with that magical computer in our pockets? Well, I think that people have sometimes seen things slow down in certain companies, whether they're innovating as fast or, or not. I mean, people like to handicap that and say, oh, well, this is happening, this isn't happening. But really what's going on behind the scenes is there's a lot of new technologies that are being created, and 5G is a great example of it. I mean, we're going to build new technologies that are not just faster, but they're going to be ready for mission-critical applications like healthcare or automotive. Uh, they're going to be ready for Internet of Things applications like going into industrial uses, or we're really interested in agriculture. Can we make a tag that's cheap enough that, you know, in some rural part of the developing world, can they have have tags on all their cattle so they know where they're wandering off to. Paul, you alluded to some of the regulatory heat that uh, Qualcomm has been facing. How smooth an approval process can you expect for NXP, $39 billion acquisition, biggest ever in the semiconductor industry, with the regulatory pressure you're still under in a number of localities around the world? So, you know, we think that it's a very complementary thing. We didn't build the deal off of a lot of synergies. Obviously, people get very concerned when they see big synergies from a regulatory standpoint. They also get concerned to see if you're getting too vertical or you're getting into a market and having too big of a, a stake in a market. And I think that in this case, it's very complementary. If asked, would you be willing to spin off the manufacturing facilities? Uh, the fabs? Yes. You know, that's not our first thought. Um, I'm not sure why somebody would ask us to do that, uh, but look, we'll listen to what the regulators have to say for sure. Coming up, a South Korean court rejected the arrest warrant for Samsung's heir apparent this week. So does this mean Jay Wiley is off the hook from accusations of bribery? We'll discuss the greater implications for the Korean tech giant next. This is Bloomberg. After months-long investigation by prosecutors, this week a South Korean court rejected a request to issue an arrest warrant for JY Lee at Samsung's heir apparent. But is the investigation completely over? We spoke with Troy Stangerone, Senior Director at Korea Economic Institute of America from Washington, along with Jeffrey Kane, an author and journalist currently writing a book about Samsung. For South Koreans, this would not be something out of line. Uh, many South Korean business leaders in the past, including Jay Lee's father, uh, have been convicted of white collar crimes. Jay Lee's father, Chairman Lee, uh, the Samsung chairman, was convicted twice of white collar crimes. And uh, because of his economic, uh, uh, you know, benefit for the nation, he was given two presidential pardons by two separate president uh, presidents, one in the 1990s and one uh, in the late 2000s. And he continued his chairmanship, uh, you know, throughout his life. He's now incapacitated from a heart attack, and his son is preparing to uh, take that chairmanship most likely. He's now the vice chairman, so he's technically the, the second 
in command of the empire, even though he's leading, uh, you know, leading in fact. Yeah. Troy, elaborate, therefore, even if this isn't that much of a surprise, potentially, to those in South Korea, how much should international investors and consumers brace themselves for change within Samsung on the back of this investigation? Well, I think initially you won't see much change at Samsung. Um, this is a company that the family's controlled for a very long time. They have a plan, and even if he were to face continued legal issues, I think you'll see that plan continue. More broadly, though, I think the larger question, at least for investors, will be, are the prosecutors able to actually tie Samsung to the government in taking and coercing it to vote for the merger through the National Pension Fund? And I think that's going to be the real key for investors going forward. So, Jeffrey, how do you react to that? If that is the key question, how more broadly does this affect conglomerates within South, within South Korea? Are we going to see a changing of the relationship between the government and these huge conglomerates? It actually is very traditional in South Korea for businesses um, to give donations and sometimes even bribes to uh, government officials. You know, this is something that goes back decades, that goes back into, into the country's authoritarianism in the past. Um, businesses uh, give favors to the government and the government gives uh, favors to these businesses. That's how the South Korean nation was built originally um, with the, the, this nexus of business and politics. And really, you know, with these allegations, um, we're seeing this question over whether, you know, Samsung was coerced, you know, into giving a donation to, to this uh, crony or whether, uh, you know, Samsung willfully went into this, you know, trying to get the, trying to get benefits, you know, for this merger that was going to happen, trying to get the National Pension Service to vote for that 2015 merger that, that got J.Y. Lee more shareholding power. Troy, I think it's fascinating. Having read through your notes before, you actually feel that perhaps this isn't the particular leader to be bashing right now, because as it goes, J.Y. Lee is relatively progressive compared to many within the conglomerates in South Korea. Are they, and will we see change if he actually is indeed ousted? Yeah, that's the interesting thing about this story. If you look at Samsung and what he's done since he's come into power, he's essentially made it much more progressive. He's taken and allowed employees to not necessarily address each other by title. He's asked that his own guards not bow to him, which is something which is traditional in South Korea. Um, he's really tried to loosen the company up and move it more towards sort of international standards. There's still more to do, but it's something that he's pushed forward. And if you also look at him and you compare him, say, for example, Korean Air to where we saw the nut rage incident last year, you know, he's a much more humble, much more laid back individual. And so if he were to be brought down by something that was very much sort of an old school Korean type of scandal, you know, I think it would actually be very detrimental because one, the question becomes, how would these reforms stay at Samsung? And two, because of Samsung's importance to the broader economy, it's also sort of a symbol of the way other chables should go. And so would that then take and hold back reforms in other chables as well? Yeah. A quick last one for you, Jeffrey. How, how much do you think this will change rivals how much will will samsung be as important to the economy going forward i think samsung will be uh, it does make up a huge uh, slice of the south korean economy and its e exports um even without jy lee the company does have a very strong reputation in the electronics industry for making great hardware for being reliable um you know if you're apple if you're uh, some other company and you need to put in a, an order for you know parts for displays for semiconductors um, Samsung is often one of the first choices because they can make things fast. They can make it faster than a lot of other companies can, and they make it at very, very high quality. And you know, in hardware, uh, they often do get this reputation as a fast follower. But in hardware, um, they're often at the leading edge. That was Troy Stangerone from the Korea Economic Institute of America, and Jeffrey Kane, author and journalist. Coming up, one of Yahoo's earliest executives opens up about the company's future and the looming $4.8 billion Verizon deal. Our exclusive with Susan Decker, former Yahoo president, next. And a reminder that all episodes of Bloomberg Technology are now live streaming on Twitter. Check us out. It's at Bloomberg Tech TV, weekdays at 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the best of Bloomberg technology. I'm Caroline Hyde. Now, Donald Trump was sworn in Friday as the 45th president of the United States. We've been asking many of our guests about the key issues impacting the future of Washington's relationship with Silicon Valley. Susan Decker, former Yahoo president and independent director of Berkshire Hathaway, joined us for a lengthy conversation on Wednesday ahead of the inauguration. We got started by asking her about President Trump's approach to technology and the changes that will come with this new administration. 
the relationship between Silicon Valley and Washington is a very good question and one that I think was due for some uh, conversation this year regardless of whether Hillary had won or Trump won. And I think that's true because there are some broader economic factors out there. You know, we, we're a generation today where our children at the age of 30 are, fewer than half of them are likely to be making more than their parents in income, which is a big reversal from the trends in America for many, many years where each set of parents felt like they wanted their kids to have it better than them. And what's happening, there's many reasons for that, but tech does play a role in the sense that a lot of the great innovations here that have added so much to this economy in the Bay Area and to other economies haven't necessarily been shared by all of America. And I think the uh, anxiety around that has been bubbling for some time. So what, regardless of who was, is sitting in the White House, I think it's an issue and I think it's going to be a really important issue how those tensions get resolved in the next year. There are different ways to solve them. I think both Silicon Valley and Washington need each other uh, in many important ways, which we could talk about. And it's really important that Silicon Valley not find itself two years from now in the, with the public perception that Wall Street has with Washington. And I think that's a risk if there isn't some olive branches extended in both directions. And so how potentially can Silicon Valley step up to a responsibility to ensure that globalization works for the many and not just the few? Is it about skills that they can provide? Is it How can they ensure they are more inclusive? Well, I think that skills is a, is a really good one. I think uh, ultimately there has to be some uh, transfer of some of the wealth that is created here and displaces workers elsewhere to those families. Now, how that transfer happens is not necessarily the uh, responsibility of Silicon Valley, but they can certainly do things like try to find, uh, educate uh, people in certain regions that may be losing jobs in coding and other, there may, there's definitely things that Silicon Valley can do. They also may find themselves in a more regulated position or taxed in certain ways that help transfer some of that wealth. And to me, the core issue that the, the, where it would be done right is if nothing in Washington ends up restricting the free flow of labor and capital that is what's creating this innovation. If tariffs and other forms of, uh, of regulation that try to keep jobs here instead of allowing foreign talented workers to stay here and keep the cost of producing low, I think that would be a bad outcome. If we could keep free capital and labor and innovation going here and then with the benefits of that figure out how to help the people who are displaced from self-driving cars and truck drivers, et cetera, I think that would be important and Silicon Valley needs to step up and look for ways that they can help. Well, many people feel Donald Trump era might bring in is perhaps less business regulation and potentially more M&A on the back of that. And we have you in here. We have to ask you about the Yahoo Verizon deal at the moment. You were very senior at Yahoo. And did you see, do you think that this is the right sort of way that Yahoo is going in terms of, did you see that it would be communications that eventually it would sell to? I think based on where Yahoo was in the last year, it was an inevitable outcome that it was to be sold. Um, I, you know, the fact that it was sold to Verizon in some ways is uh, very logical. They own AOL and there's probably a, a good um, consolidation opportunity to look at the properties that AOL has and the ones that Yahoo has, which ones overlap, cut some costs. So I can see the business logic behind it. Why was it inevitable? I, I think it was inevitable because the core uh, issue at Yahoo is that no administration that's been running it, including the one Jerry and I were in place, has been able to solve is what the core distinction is in consumers' mind of what makes Yahoo great. And in my mind, it was all about content. With Yahoo, today they're still struggling with what their core identity is because they didn't get really great in the thing that they were, they were, they had a core identity in and they were got sort of mediocre in everything because they were spread so so broadly. So I think by the time the last year came along, it, it needed to be sold. I sort of wish it had been uh, sold to a, a company that was more 
I, I, I don't know what Verizon will do. I hope they, they revitalize that key spirit of, and make it unique again, but uh, who knows. Would there have been a perfect buyer from your point of view? I think either way it should have been, it, it needed to become private or semi-private. By being in Verizon, even though Verizon's a public company, it's a small part and so they'll be able to take the steps that are hard and long-term in nature that couldn't have been taken when it was a public company because of all the media scrutiny. Mm -hmm. So whether it was a private buyer or whether it becomes a subsidiary of a public company, I think this is a good home in the sense that um, I think they can probably make some tough decisions and try to revitalize it. Was some of the media scrutiny unfair on Marissa Meyer, do you think? Probably, yeah. I think she, uh, I think she did the I think she was t dealt a tough hand. I think, and I would say really, some of the seeds of the challenges at Yahoo were sown very early in its years. I mean, it, so I think when you inherit a company that's already operating in certain ways, it isn't easy to change it. Uh, I think there's certain things she probably wish she did differently, just like all of us probably wish we did certain things differently. Uh, but I think she, uh, I think she did the best she could, and, and unfortunately, it wasn't enough. What about the hacks that seem to have come, the disclosures much later in the day than they actually occurred? How much do you think that might affect the price point with Verizon? How much do you think Marissa Meyer and, and the people at the helm of Yahoo should be taking responsibility for that sort of occurrence? Well, I, I don't know how it'll affect the price, if, if at all. Um, I think it's certainly possible that there could be a renegotiation to some degree. I don't think it will uh, stop the deal from going through. Uh, and uh, sure, I think that the leadership of the company should always take responsibility when something goes awry on their watch, even if uh, whatever happened had seeds in a previous administration. I don't know uh, what the, I don't know anything about the background of that. But yeah, it's the right thing to do to step up when you're leading a company. When you sort of look back on, on where Yahoo went, do you think they were correct to sort of get into these, to, into Alibaba, a Chinese company, look at for value abroad in the way that they seem to? Yeah, I do. I mean, I think if you look at the original stake in Alibaba uh, that you know we struck in 2005, that would be worth $70 a Yahoo share today. So if you look at, uh, it was sold over the years in pieces. So today it's, it's worth um, considerably less than that. But still, it, it was the single biggest value creator in Yahoo's history. So I feel like, you know, it's, it's, it's a sad sunset for this company. It makes me really, uh, I, I, you know, we all had a great love for Yahoo. We bled purple. We wish it were different. But I think it did in, innovate in many ways and uh, did create some great value. And there are some wonderful leaders who are all over the valley now who got, you know, cut their chops there. Are there any other companies out there at the moment that you think are excelling or perhaps you're worried about that need to be looking at their strategy here within the, the valley? You know, I think that we're in an unusual situation here for Silicon Valley. We touched on it earlier, but you have companies like Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft in the top 10 in market cap in the world. So when you think about you know, top companies in the S&P 500, Silicon Valley and north <laughs> to Seattle are a big part of that. So it's, it's very important that this relationship with Washington gets resolved in an effective way. A man who's spoken about the way in which the pie is divided is Warren Buffett, a, a man you work alongside of Berkshire Hathaway, and a company of significant scale and value in and of itself as well. It seems to be sitting on quite a significant cash load at the moment. Is this something that you see being returned to investors at any point? I, I, I would say, uh, it's possible. <laughs> I don't think there's any pressure in the next several years to be returning that cash. I think one of the things that's so remarkable about Berkshire Hathaway is it is a collection of businesses that generate a lot of cash, mm. and many of them generate more than they need, and others are quite capital intensive, like the railroad businesses. So you have insurance and other cap consumer businesses that generate cash and a tax-free, efficient way to reallocate that cash to businesses that need them. And that's been a wonderful model. So, but it isn't a, a model that's even every year. You know, a, a major acquisition could come up and it's good to have the resources on the balance sheet to be ready for that kind of acquisition coming up. So that I don't see, as long as the core capital allocation proposition is working for investors, taking capital that's not 
productive and putting it into highly productive uses at a value creating way, I think investors will be tolerant of short periods of time where the cash builds up before the next big deal. Coming up, we speak to Facebook's head of European operations and dive into the key areas the tech behemoth is targeting in 2017. Plus, Salesforce CEO Mark Benioff joins us from the World Economic Forum in Davos on rising competition and why he's not worried. This is Bloomberg. Facebook has just revealed a massive survey. The social media giant unveiled the 2017 Future of Business survey in partnership with the World Bank and the OECD. We caught up with Facebook's Vice President of Europe, Middle East and Africa, Nicola Mendelssohn, and asked her about the major takeaways from the survey. Take a listen. We've actually found that on the whole, businesses are feeling pretty confident about where their businesses are right now. But actually what's really interesting is the outlook for six months from, and that's when they're feeling much more confident. And you can go into the survey, anyone can go into the survey and really dig in and have a look about different countries, how they're feeling. One of the things that uh, stuck out to me when I was looking at it was actually that the UK small businesses were on the whole feeling much more confident than the rest of Europe about their outlook for their businesses. And then when you start to look further into the survey, you can see that businesses that are really embracing online tools are actually businesses that are more likely to be working internationally, to actually have, uh, to be selling around the world. And again, that's something different that we've seen as a result of mobile technology. You know, when I was growing up uh, and my parents have got a small business and my grandparents had a small business, it, they could only sell in, the, in their geographical vicinity, if you like, in the area that they were in. But now, if you understand your, your customers, you can actually sell anywhere in the world. And the survey also so shows up some of the challenges that businesses are facing as well in that respect. Could you see any of the nuances coming up to the fore post the Brexit vote in the United Kingdom in June, post the election of Donald Trump in the United States? Did you see that coming to the fore from US and UK businesses? We certainly saw with um, post-Brexit that there was a dip in confidence, but that's very much come back and businesses in the UK are feeling very confident. What, one of the things that really stuck out to me with the research, though, was how women and how female business owners are feeling at the moment when it comes to their businesses and their outlooks as well. And actually, a lot of that is really contrary to how what we might think conventional wisdom uh, might say at the moment. So I think when we think about businesses that maybe market online or businesses that are online, we may, might not necessarily necessarily think that they're being run by women. But actually what this research is telling us is that women are actually using online tools to market their business and to grow their business more so than men. And why that matters, why that's important, because they're the businesses that are more likely to be trading internationally. And crucially, they're the businesses that actually are looking to expand and looking to employ more people in the not too distant future. So we're seeing a very strong correlation between jobs growth that are coming as a result of the digital economy. And what is the role of Facebook within the role of business going forward? This is called the Future of Business Survey. Where do you see yourself within it? Because you launched recently the Facebook for Work program. Is it because you want to be much more enterprise focused? Well, we take our responsibility in, in the way that we work with our partners around the world very seriously. And actually, the, the Facebook at workplace, where that came from, was actually from different organizations coming to us and saying to us, tell us about how you run Facebook as a business. And the way that we run Facebook as a business is through workplace. You know, we, we use Facebook, we use the groups, we use messages to be able to connect around the world and to work in a very efficient way together. So that's where it really came from. It came from our partners saying, tell us how you do it. And now we've expanded it out and you know, we have thousands of companies around the world that are utilizing Workplace as a way of bridging the gap, if you like, from the CEO to the person that's on the factory floor. And we're seeing businesses now of all different sizes that are really embracing it because it can allow them to be much closer to the people that work with them. And it can allow a really great efficiency between the CEO uh, and the different people within the organizations. It's been a challenging few months for Salesforce.com. Rising competition in cloud applications from legacy vendors such as SAP, Microsoft, and of course Oracle has slowed growth. But the company has seen a strong start to 2017. Shares are up more than 7% year to date. And their company's forecasting sales will jump 21% in 2018. Speaking to Bloomberg from the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, CEO Mark Benioff discussed the company's growth as well as the competition. 
We had to just do what we were doing right from the beginning, which was connect with our customers and help them connect with their customers in a whole new way. And that's what is so exciting about what Salesforce does today. I mean, that's why so many companies here at Davos you see using yeah. Salesforce, because there's this sea change going on and that companies are really working hard to develop that uh, customer intimacy and, and uh, Salesforce. But you've got a lot of competition. How do you compete with the other pretenders to what you invented? Well, on one side, Amazon's a great partner of ours, actually, and we yes. uh, and, and a great customer of ours, too. In <clears> fact, <throat> Amazon uses Salesforce to connect to its customers in sales and service and marketing. Right. Um, but on the other side, we also work with a lot of amazing retailers like a Brunello Cuccinelli, who you know, or Louis Vuitton, or even C's Candy. Why do you think they I all know run? Cuccinelli? No, why do I you have a feeling you know Brunello Cuccinelli. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And here's the thing: those guys, those next-gen retailers who are kind of getting slaughtered in the brick-and-mortar world, they, they need Salesforce to connect with their customers in a new way through retail. So these are exciting times. They're exciting times, and I guess everybody's making money. But you have your critics. How are you going to position Salesforce? within the new technology. You're one of the few technology guys in Happy Valley here. Well, how That's are you going to reposition, not for the next 12 months, yeah. but for the next five years? Yeah. I can't imagine where my iPhone 7 is in five years. Well, I'll tell you the thing that's amazing about CRM, when we started, our business in 1999, like you said, CRM or customer management was nascent, a small market, right. but it'll be the largest segment of enterprise software by 2020, a hundred billion dollar TAM. Mm -hmm. And today we're number one in that segment and we're really continuing to innovate and look for ways that we can help our customers become more successful. In your world, we're going to go through a phone. How does Salesforce.com and your competitors handle the cloud through whichever phone we have in our hand, business or personal? Well, I think that that's fascinating, you know, how you think about computing today. I mean, we just, you just made a huge shift in your mind <clears throat> from where we started with personal computers into the most popular computer today is the mobile phone, billions and billions mm -hmm. of them, and now they're making them for $20 mm -hmm. so that everybody can have a computer far more powerful than the most powerful Macintosh or you mentioned. You knew the Lisa yeah. before the Lisa was Lisa. You know, that is uh, um, something now in your pocket that's way beyond that capability. But now computers are going to disappear because we see voice right. taking over. You see things like Alexa from Amazon. You see like Google Home and others where we're just talking to our computers right. and walking into a room or talking to our watch. And that's an incredible next generation of computing. Coming up, how will Snapchat's parent company transition its ultra-secretive culture into a public company? We'll look at the road ahead for Snap and its highly anticipated IPO. This is Bloomberg. Well, as we reported last week, Snap has chosen London for its European headquarters, despite ongoing Brexit concerns. Snap is gearing up for an IPO in the months ahead, and Snapchat's secretive culture well, is now coming into focus. CEO Evan Spiegel's leadership style is getting tested as he convinces investors of the company's potential. Executives have been reluctant to release any details that are not legally required to divulge. We caught up with Bloomberg's IPO reporter Alex Barinka and Bloomberg technology reporter Sarah Fryer. Take a listen. They are a secretive company and they're really young. And so you're going to need to see some visibility into the future. Uh, you'll recall right now they're on file confidentially. So there is some financial information filed with the SEC that some people have been able to get their hands on. But until we see the actual S1, we won't have uh, that filed publicly. We won't have income statements, balance sheets, things like that. And this all kind of plays into this really close to the vest culture that uh, Evan Spiegel has maintained. And look, when you think about this offering, it's a social media company. The last one to go out was Twitter, and there was kind of an, an overhang because Twitter didn't necessarily lay out a huge strategy uh, when it went public, and that kind of came back uh, to bite them later. So you have to expect that when investors are considering whether to buy in at the IPO and hold on to this stock, they're going to need more uh, strategy-wise than what Evan is typically uh, willing to give out. And Sarah, this is something you've potentially been running up against for several years. I mean, Evan Spiegel himself wanting to only really speak on background to reporters and notably not really even divulging much to his own team. 
Not really. I mean, being an employee for Snapchat is kind of like being somebody on the outside of Snapchat in terms of what you get to know. Uh, the employees there don't get a heads up on what products people are working on. Uh, they don't get to use their phones at the New Year's party. There are little things that the offices are not in some kind of corporate campus like you see for Facebook and Google. They're scattered across Venice, California on the beach in various office buildings. There are no all hands meetings uh, like it, are just a staple of Silicon Valley startup culture here. And so a lot of people are just kind of in the dark within Snapchat about where the company's headed. Now, Evan Spiegel is going to have to tell investors on a roadshow not just about where the company's been, but where it's headed. Like Alex said, this is the time to explain the long-term vision for what Snap is and can be. And certainly, Alex, investors will need some soothing if they're not going to gain much control of the overall company. It looks as though we say Facebook copies Snap. Well, it looks like maybe Evan Spiegel is copying Mark Zuckerberg here. That's right. It's a lot of trust that's going to have to be put into Evan Spiegel. And, you know, they have been pitching, according to folks that we're talking to, Evan as this kind of visionary CEO. Trust him. He's won the millennial um, cohort over now. He can figure out what's going on in the future. And they're going to have to with this kind of striated employee base uh, with uh, no all hands meetings Evan is the guy who is in control he's the one who sees the full picture of what's going on and it's a big ask and he also is going to be the one they're gonna have to trust to control the information flow I mean we've already seen that come out in the IPO process itself this coming out party for the company the company scolding their bankers threatening to cut fees if things keep leaking so a lot of onus is going to be put on Evan and again after uh, Twitter has gone out uh, after you know some of these missteps with these other very uh, big founder led companies it's a big ask to ask of investors to do IPO might go well it's the first tech company in a long time but again the long-term investors that you really want to buy into these public offerings they are going to be the ones they're going to need to convince that this is going to be the company to buy into not for the IPO not for the next year but the next next five to ten years and to do that it's gonna have to be a bet on Spiegel and Sarah what are you hearing about how well you think the culture change will progress with Evan Spiegel do you think he really understands how much moral disclosure he will have to give being a public company I think he's still going to in, in the nature of how the company has run so far probably give as little information as he can because for Evan he thinks you know what what is it worth it to him to to expound more on what Snapchat's going to plan to do, given, uh, like you mentioned earlier, the threats from Facebook. Facebook has copied Snapchat over and over. That does it for this edition of Best of Bloomberg Technology. We'll bring you all the latest in tech throughout the week. Be sure to tune in on Thursday for full coverage of a slew of big earnings from Alphabet to Microsoft. Tune in each day, 5 p.m. New York, 2 p.m. San Francisco, and 6 a.m. in Hong Kong. Remember, all episodes of Bloomberg Technology are now live streaming on Twitter. Check us out. It's at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.